Good morning, Heart of Worship Community Church. Happy Lord's Day to you. If you have your Bible, uh, please open it with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. And if you are able to stand, let us stand for the reading of God's Word. John, chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, He who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless he has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has made the bride is the bridegroom, or he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him, Rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your word that you have given to us this morning, your word that you have given to us not only to hear, but to believe and to apply. And Lord, as we listen to your word this morning, we pray for your spirit to minister to our hearts, help us to understand uh, what it is that you would require of us from this word, not only individually, but even as a corporate church, heart of worship, community church. May you receive all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is, He Must Increase, We must decrease. He must increase, we must decrease. So this morning, we're going to be looking at the life and ministry of John the Baptist. It will not be an in-depth look, but enough for us to have a good understanding of who he was and why he is an example for us of humility in ministry. John the Baptist was a prophet of God. He was a prophet in that he had been set apart by the Lord as a messenger to speak a specific word to a specific people. Therefore, he spoke with authority, he spoke with boldness, and he called for repentance among his hearers. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ said about John in Matthew 11 verse 9 that he is more than a prophet. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So he was more than a prophet. Matthew 11, verse 10 says, This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And so he had, had a unique purpose among the prophets of God in that even the prophets of the Old Testament had prophesied about him. 400 years earlier in uh, the verse that the Lord quoted, and I'll read it again in Malachi, Malachi prophesied in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, Behold, I am going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me, says the Lord of hosts. So that was John, the last of the prophets before the Messiah. A man who understood his life, uh, his purpose in life, and his purpose in ministry. It was to prepare the way for the Lord. I like what one preacher said about John the Baptist, and it's something that's um, stuck in my mind since the beginning of my ministry, where he said, 
Um, he prepared the way. He preached the way. He got out of the way. In other words, um, it's not about you. It's not about the minister. Um, I like how another man of God put it, Nicholas Zenzendorf, who said, the preacher of God must be content to preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. He also said, and I quote, since I will soon be dead, it does not matter ultimately who knows me now. After I am dead, I will not know whether or not I am remembered while my body is still lying in the grave, awaiting the glorious resurrection. It is in God's hands to use or not to use my life's work as it best promotes his undying glory. In view of death and the eternal enjoyment of God, the fears, infirmities, and anxieties of my life fade from view. And I can gladly accept Paul's admonition to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands. So that's a man, end quote. So that's a man who understood his purpose, who understood his place. That must be true of every minister. That must be true of every child of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 5, Paul writes, After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news. So three things that these men had in common, John the Baptist, Paul, Nicholas Zinzendorf, is humility. Humility which is needed in every minister and child of God. Going back to, to John the Baptist, if anyone had reason to boast, it would be John. Luke chapter 1 verse 5 says about John, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. So imagine that, being filled with the Holy Spirit before birth. Um, no one can boast that. I already mentioned that he was the forerunner to the Lord. And he was unique in that ministry. Jesus said he is the greatest of all men. Add to that a very successful ministry. So if anyone had reason to boast, it's John the Baptist. Yet in our text, John gives us a lesson in humility. In one of those um, one-liners that you can live by, such as Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, right? We all know that. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's many people's life verse. But I like John chapter 3, verse 30, um, just as much. He must increase, but I must decrease. So we look, into, we look at this text, and what we see here is two ministries. Two ministries that are thriving. The Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist. Very close um, proximity to each other. Both ministers, both ministries are somewhere along the Jordan River, which they're using for baptisms. In verses 22 to 23 of our text, it says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was an abundance of water there, and people were coming and being baptized. As John clarifies in John chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus is not actually performing the baptisms. His disciples were. Um, they were not Christian baptisms at this point, but more public confessions of sin, followed by immersion in water, which symbolize cleansing from sin. Now, verse 24, the apostle John, um, not John the Baptist, you know, people get mixed up between John the Baptist and the Apostle John. The Apostle John is, is the writer of the Gospel of John and one of the original 12. Uh, John the Baptist is the forerunner to the Lord. So we understand that, right? So John the Apostle in verse 22 or 24 um, mentions that John the Baptist had not yet been thrown into prison. And the reason for this side note is because John knew 
that his readers would have already read the Gospel of Mark, uh, which makes it seem that Jesus' ministry began after John the Baptist was in prison. Uh, Mark 1 verse 14 says, Now after John was imprisoned, Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the gospel of John. And so that's the reason for that side note in verse 24. He just wants to make it clear that these events are happening before John is put in prison. Verse 25, we see that a dispute arose between John's disciples and the Jew about purification. Uh, we don't know the details of the discussion, so we're not going to take time today to try to speculate. Um, that's just what was going on. But what we do know is verse 26. John's disciples says to John, Rabbi, he who was with you in the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all the people are coming to him. So John the Baptist had disciples people who followed him, people who were faithful and loyal. And they see that the ministry of the Lord is growing. People are beginning to follow Christ. Remember, John had a thriving ministry. And so they saw Jesus as a competitor, as a threat to the ministry of John. And what we see here is jealousy, envy, Comparison. In the context of church ministry, uh, when churches and God's people begin to envy and compare their ministry to other ministries, um, that's not only wrong, but it's uh, very dangerous, especially for heart, our heart, issues of the heart. Remember the message last week on talents. God requires us to be faithful with what he has entrusted to us. He may give more to this one, to this person. He may give more to this person. But it all comes from the Lord. And we are to be faithful with whatever he gives to us. Sometimes you hear of, of churches uh, praying for uh, more people. And in, in one sense, there's nothing wrong with that. You want to see people saved. You want to see people coming, um, you know, to your church. You want to see growth. But I like um, what one minister said regarding praying for more people. And I'm paraphrasing here. He said, I don't really pray for more people. I pray that I'll be faithful with the people God has already given to me. It's like I'm saying to God when I keep praying for more people that I'm already done with all the people I have been entrusted with. I've already discipled everyone. Everyone is complete in Christ. Therefore, send me more. Plus, who would want to be accountable to the Lord for all those people? As pastor has read in Acts, um, the leader is accountable to the Lord for the flock that has been entrusted. I'd rather be accountable for 10 than 1,000. That's, that's a scary uh, responsibility. So pray to be faithful. And if the Lord gives more, then the Lord gives more. But pray to be faithful. Because it's not a competition. It's not about who has more. When that becomes the goal or the concern, uh, the focus has turned from the Lord to the minister to the church, to our self-esteem, to our reputation, to our glory. And again, nothing wrong about growth. We pray for growth in every area. But when it leads to comparing envy, pride, and jealousy, it's not pleasing to the Lord. So if the Lord gives growth, so be it. But let numbers never be the reason or the focus. Be faithful and content with what God has given, whether it's one or whether it's a hundred. And if the Lord uses other ministries and churches, rejoice that the kingdom of God is growing. 
We need to have the attitude of Paul in Philippians chapter 1. Remember in this book, Paul was imprisoned. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 18, Paul writes, in prison, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Um, how, you might ask. Well, verse 13, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the, the praetorian guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brothers and sisters trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now notice verse 15. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. In other words, the motives of some preachers were wrong, while the motives of others were, were right. Verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking they are causing me distress in my imprisonment. Verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. So here we see a similar situation between John the Baptist and, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. The Apostle Paul is in prison. There are those who um, are preaching the truth of, their, of the gospel. They're actually preaching the truth. But they're trying to discredit Paul and his ministry. And they're saying he's in prison because not of faithfulness, we know he was in prison because he was faithful to the gospel, but they're saying he's in prison because he's unfaithful to the gospel. So they're trying to discredit his ministry. And so what is the attitude of Paul in response to this? He says, I rejoice. I'm happy that the gospel is proclaimed. Doesn't matter who receives the credit. He rejoiced that Christ is preached. It's not a competition. It's not the numbers game. Um, he's faithful to preach, whether it's um, to the masses on Mars Hill when he confronted uh, the religious idolatry of the Greeks, or to the one prison guard that he was chained to in prison. He was faithful. Now, that's not true of John's disciples, though, as far as their attitude is concerned. They viewed Jesus as a threat. They wouldn't even say Jesus' name if you look at the text. And incredibly, they also missed the purpose of John's ministry, which was to point the people to Christ. How do we know that? They said, you have testified of him, but yet they are complaining about him. Talk about blindness. So John's reply to them in verses 27 to 30 is a great lesson in humility. And if we want to be able to honestly say and apply in our hearts John 3 verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. Um, there's a couple of things from this passage that we can um, learn, that we can apply. Verse 27, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You can apply this to, to all spiritual matters, but in the context, uh, John the Baptist is talking about his ministry and the fruitfulness of ministry. In other words, my role is to be a forerunner of the Lord. My responsibility was to prepare the way. That's it. If God chooses to, to change my ministry, if God chooses to, to end my ministry, I'm content. Every ministry opportunity, whether big or small, is from the Lord. And it's something that we are not entitled to. Therefore, there's no place for, for jealousy. There's no place for competition. So if a man can receive nothing unless he has been given to him from heaven. Um, what that tells us, in other words, God is sovereign. So when things are going well in ministry, God is sovereign. God is in control. 
When things are not going well in ministry, God is sovereign. God is in control. Very important to remind ourselves that because it will keep us humble. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 to 6 so it says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are different results, but the same God who produces all of them in every one. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each individually just as he wills. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, when Paul asks, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Then verses 6 to 7, Paul writes, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Um, that's very humbling where it says, is anything. Basically, we're nothing. Um, Paul says, I'm, I'm a lower galley uh, slave. Um, meaning he's all the way at the bottom rowing. You know, the boats when the slaves, he had to do the hardest work. That's all we are, slaves. So we need to remember, God is sovereign. But also remember that Jesus is Lord and Christ. Verse 28, you yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent by him. Now, of course, no one is going to mistake in, um, any of us for being Christ. Uh, but remember the context. Uh, many people were still not sure um, that Jesus was the Messiah. And John the Baptist had many loyal followers. So he had to remind them, I'm not the Christ. I came to prepare the way for Christ, but I'm not the Christ. It's not about me. In the same way, it would be good for every minister, for every child of God to remind ourselves sometimes that we're not God. Uh, we would never say it. We will never probably even think it. But sometimes we act like it. Especially when we feel entitled. Especially when we want things our way. Uh, we must remember that all we are is servants of God. Slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 29, John then uses this illustration of a best man in a wedding to continue to drive home the point. He says, he who has the bride is the groom, but the friend of the groom who stands and listens to him rejoices greatly because of the groom's voice. What are the responsibilities of the best man? Well, in that culture, the best man would take care of all the duties, all the responsibilities for the groom. The groom would need to have the house ready before uh, the wedding even took place. And his best man did all the work, including the communicating with the bride, letting the bride know when, where, um, you know, where to meet, how to get there. So when the day of the wedding came, the best man would take the bride and present the bride to the groom. So John here is saying, that's my job. I'm not the bridegroom, I'm the best man. And my job, just like the, be the job of the best man, which is to connect the bride to the bridegroom, is to connect the bride, the church, to Christ. That's my job. In the Old Testament, we know that Yahweh is often pictured as the bridegroom or the husband of Israel. For example, Isaiah 54, verse 5, the Lord tells Israel, For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Isaiah chapter 62, uh, verse 5, the second half of verse 5, And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Hosea chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord tells Israel that in the future they will call the Lord my husband. 
Hosea chapter 2, verse 19, God promises, I will betroth you to me forever. So he uses this analogy of himself when he explained to some of John's disciples, talking about the Lord now, why they didn't fast. John's disciples were asking Jesus, you know, why, why do you guys not fast? Well, Jesus says, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Can they? But the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast. So the same analogy is, is used in the New Testament, where Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. So having said all that, if Yahweh is Israel's bridegroom in the Old Testament, and John the Baptist proclaims Jesus as Israel's bridegroom, then it's an affirmation that Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is God. So going back to the role of the best man, when the best man has done his job, has fulfilled his responsibility, he takes the bride, connects the bride with the bridegroom, and disappears from the scene. The focus shifts from the best man to the bridegroom. Now why mention the bridegroom's voice? Why does the friend or the best man rejoice greatly over the bridegroom's voice? Well, one reason, I would think, is because this means that the bridegroom is here, right? He's fulfilled his duty. But in John 1, verse 23, John the Baptist described himself as the voice crying in the wilderness. So his own voice has gathered a people. But now they are leaving and they are going to follow another voice. Because another voice is heard. A stronger voice. A greater voice. John chapter 10, verse 3 to 4, Jesus says, The sheep hear my voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. So the bride of the bridegroom knows the voice of her husband. And she leaves the best man to go to her groom. So now John, the forerunner, rejoices in the voice of the bridegroom, which is Christ, because his voice gathers his bride to him, away from John, away from the minister of God. Thus, John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. This is what must happen, and in this I rejoice. Notice in verse 30, the must. He must. This is God's must. This is not man's must. This is God's must. It's the must of a divine plan. Verse 27, I mentioned that, that the giving is in the context of ministry and fruitful ministry, but it can also be referring specifically to God giving, God the Father giving people to his son. John's disciples were, were complaining, right? People are coming to Jesus. Do you want to know why people were coming to Jesus? Because that was a part of God's plan. Going back to, to the sovereignty of God, John 6, verse 27, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. So who's doing the giving? Why are they coming? It's God's doing. God is sovereign. Giving these people to his son. And because of this, John rejoiced. And he says, this joy of mine has been made full. And so what made John's disciples jealous made John joyful. 
And that should be the attitude of every child of God. When we see people coming to the Lord, doesn't matter through what ministry, doesn't matter through what church, assuming, of course, they're preaching the true gospel. But we should rejoice that people are coming to the Lord. Even in the context of, of our church, Heart of Worship Community Church, um, we need to ask ourselves we are honestly rejoicing and being joyful when we see God using our brothers and sisters in the Lord? Or do we get resentful? Do we get jealous because we're not in the limelight? Because we're not getting the credit or we didn't come up with uh, whatever you know, they're doing? Again, we're not in competition with each other. We're in the same, we're on the same team. So John understood his purpose, and he understood his role, and his aim and his joy was to bring the bride to the bridegroom, because he understood the wedding is not about us, it's about Christ, and we should never want to compete with the bridegroom for the affection or the attention of the bride. Imagine going to a wedding and um, the best man is here and there's the groom and the bride and the best man's trying to get everybody's attention. Oh, look at me, look at me. Forget you, right? It's not about you. But yet there are many in the, servants, in, in the um, service of the Lord who try to take the attention from the Lord. I love this quote from... This preacher named Robert Murray McChain, he said, I see a man cannot be a faithful minister until he preaches Christ for Christ's sake, until he gives up striving to attract people to himself and seek only to attract them to Christ. So that's John the Baptist, faithful. But what happened to John the Baptist? What's the end of his story? Going back to verse 24, the side note, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So John gets thrown into prison. And according to Matthew 14, verse 1 to 12, and Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29, you can go there um, in your own time. Um, it tells the story of, of why and, and what happened. But I'm just going to explain it to you in a nutshell. Herodias, the wife of King Herod, was responsible for persuading her husband to behead John the Baptist while he was in prison. More than once, John the Baptist rebuked the king for divorcing his wife and marrying his niece. So Herodias, the wife of the king, was angry at John because he dared to speak out. So Herod had thrown John into prison. And as a ruler of the Roman Empire, um, he could have had John executed, but I think he sort of respected John. But more, more than anything, he feared John. He feared what killing John would do or what would happen. But despite this, Mark 6, verse 19, says, So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. And the idea in the original Greek is that she actively sought his death, just waiting for, for the opportunity to have him killed. So she sees the opportunity at Herod's birthday party. So there's a banquet. Herodias' daughter performed a dance to arouse the audience. And Herod told the young girl in Mark chapter 6, verses 22 to 23, Ask me for anything you like, and I will give it to you, up to half my kingdom. So Herodias' daughter went and asked her mother, What should I ask for? Queen Herodias replied, Ask for the head of John the Baptist, verse 24. 
So Herodias comes back to Herod, says in verse 25, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So unable to take back his oath, Herod granted her wish. He sent his executioner to the prison where John the Baptist was beheaded. The soldier returned to the banquet with John's head on a platter, presented, to the, presented it to the girl, who then in turn gave it to her mother. Like mother, like daughter, right? Terrible. Now John the Baptist, before he went to prison, remember, he said he must increase, but I must decrease. He meant that with his heart, not knowing uh, where it would lead him. Whenever we make um, an oath to the Lord, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to follow you anywhere. We may mean that, but we don't know ultimately what the Lord will, how the Lord will answer that. We just need to be ready for whatever he requires of us. He required of John not only imprisonment, and I read that it was about 18 months in prison, but death. And as he sat in prison, um, I believe a year into his prison sentence, he began to doubt the Lord or to doubt if Jesus was really the Messiah. So the same man who saw Jesus um, walking and declaring, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world uh, was now beginning to doubt if this is really the Messiah. In the same way, there are times in our walk with the Lord, there are times in our ministry that we may be tempted to doubt the Lord. We expect one thing and we get something else. We begin to doubt or forget his faithfulness, his ability to provide, his ability to change people, to change circumstances. So as he sat in prison, Matthew 11 verse 3 says that he sent his disciples to Jesus and told them to ask Jesus, are you the expected one? Or shall we look for someone else? Jesus replied in Matthew 11, verse 46, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. So Jesus sends back John's disciples as eyewitnesses of his miracles. Miracles that were prophesied about the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 29 and in Isaiah chapter 35. Miracles that the prophet said this would accompany the Messiah. So Jesus performs them in their presence just so that he could report back to John that they had personally seen proof that he was the Messiah. Notice, however, in typical Jesus fashion, he offered no further explanation to John. He simply said, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. I believe Jesus did not answer with a simple yes or no because he knew that John would not be satisfied with that answer. That's why he pointed back to the scripture, which is more, even more reliable. Remember what the Old Testament says. I'm fulfilling the Old Testament in your presence. So he told John's disciples, present this to your teacher. With evidence. Now what does it mean when he says, Blessed he who is he who does not take offense at me. To take offense at Christ is to stumble over the revelation we have of Jesus Christ in his word. So does Christ and his cross 
offend you. When a person begins to stumble over Christ, they are living in unbelief. To stumble over the incarnation, to stumble over his sinless life, to stumble over his perfect obedience, to stumble over his co-equality with God the Father, to stumble over his eternality, is to deny the person of Christ that is revealed in the word. To stumble over the necessity of the cross. To stumble over Christ being the only one to bear our sins before God's judgment. To stumble over the reality of the resurrection. And Jesus Christ as the only Savior for sinners. To stumble over the effectiveness of Christ as our great high priest. To stumble over the certainty of Christ's return is to scorn the gospel. This kind of stumbling moves people away from Christ. Many in the church accept some of the principles of Christ's teaching while at the same time rejecting the biblical revelation of Jesus Christ's person and work. So in the case of John's disciples, John was telling them, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's telling them who Christ is. They even admit that this is the one that you are testifying about. Yet they complain that people come to him. I liken them to people who call Jesus Lord, Lord, but don't really know what they're saying. Does this describe you? Are you that person who just accepts the principles of Scripture while rejecting what the Bible says about Jesus Christ and his work? If it is you, you're moving away from Christ. Because what you find the Bible teaches is offensive to you. But Christ pro promises genuine happiness, joy for those who don't take offense to him. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Jesus knew that John knew his prophecies regarding the Old Testament that he knew that these signs would accompany the Lord. And he's telling John, um, you see these prophecies regarding me? That's the answer to your question. It's a warning, but it's also a rebuke from the Lord to not doubt. Don't doubt if you want to have the blessing of my joy and peace. Now, the Bible does not record John's reaction, but I think it's safe to assume that it renewed his faith and his confidence in the Lord. And even though his situation did not change, we know that he died in prison, I believe he died having no doubts who Jesus was, trusting in his goodness, in his sovereignty, and in his wisdom. Wherever we find ourselves in our walk with the Lord, wherever we find ourselves in ministry, um, it's always good to remember that. The, the standards of the world is different than the standards of God's kingdom. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithless. Faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So even when we doubt God, God is faithful to us. Doubt doesn't cause us to lose our relationship to God because God cannot deny his promises to keep those whom he has saved. And because of his faithfulness, like John, we can always 
Ask the Lord. Go to the Lord. So after a year or 18 months in imprisonment, John the Baptist was murdered. John the Baptist was dead. His work is done. A true prophet of God, uncompromising to the end, faithful to the very, very end. And we must remember, brothers and sisters, that our role in the church, however big or small, is not our reward. Jesus is our reward. Roles begin, roles will end. But the only way to end well is if in our hearts Jesus has increased and we have decreased. And when Jesus increases, guess what? Joy increases. This pastor preached last week, and as I remember the reminder, the joy of the Lord, that's our strength. Not the numbers, not the whatever ministry comes, but simply joy in ministry. And joy in ministry, if our heart is right, is when we see the Lord lifted up and the Lord honored above everything else. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have much to be thankful for this morning. So much to praise you for. You have given us your truth. And may we as your people, we as your children, we as your church, exalt Christ together. May we fade away as Christ and his glory fills all in all. May it always be about Christ. We thank you for bringing us to the knowledge of Christ. And I pray for those that are in our midst this morning who may not know Christ, that you would be gracious enough, Lord, to allow the light of the gospel to shine upon their darkened hearts and their darkened minds, that they may see Christ for who he is, that they may understand the gospel the salvation that is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And if that is you this morning, this is not an offer or, or a gift offered by any institution or by any church. It is an offer and a gift given by God the Father himself through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I urge you, if you have not yet come to Christ that you would turn to him, that you would ask him to be merciful to you, a sinner, and that you would put your faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, not in anything that you have done, but in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for you. And the Bible says that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so, so, Lord, we thank you again for this deposit that you have given to us every time we come around your word. May we spend that treasure as needed to declare your word to the glory and the honor of your name. And all of God's people say, Amen. I'm so